Hello, I'm Maciej, uh, and I'm a data scientist at List. We're a, um, we're a fashion company. We basically go all around the internet and we get all sorts of fashion products from all sorts of retailers and all sorts of designers, put them all in one place so that as a user you can just go to one website and, and follow your favorite designers and browse all your favorite fashion products and buy them from us. Uh, so that's the principle. And I'm going to, to be talking about nearest neighbor search. So nearest neighbor search is very simple in principle. Basically, you have a point, and you want, you want to find other points that are close to it. So the most obvious applications is obviously maps. So uh, that's something we use every day. You've got, uh, you've got, let's say, your location on a map, and you want to ask Google or Bing or whoever you want to ask, what are the nearest res restaurants to me, or what are the nearest cafes, and, and that's what it does. It figures out where you are, or you, rather you give it the location, and then it looks up other, other points on the map, the restaurants that you're looking for, and then calculates the distances between where you are and the, when the restaurant is, and, and tries to give you the closest ones. So that's basically the essence of nearest neighbor search. Given a point, give me other points that are close to it. Now, this is the most obvious application, um, but it's, even if you're not building a mapping application, which you may well not be building, uh, we certainly aren't, you may still find it very useful. So what do we use it for? Well, we use it for image search and we use it for recommendations. So image search, how does it work? The principle of image search is, well, you've got an image. Uh, let's, say, let's say we had a user and they submit an image to us of a dress and they want, they want us to give them images of similar dresses or something, something that's a good substitute for the dress that they've submitted to us. So, as programmers, it's sort of hard to find similar images just by looking at an image. So the first step you want to do is to transform an image into something that you can more easily work with. So one very naive idea would be to, let's say, well, we've got an image, which is RGB, like red, blue, and, uh, green, and blue, and these are three numbers, and for a given image, we could average the values of each color and then try to find other uh, images in our database which have sort of similar color values. And that's a very naive approach and it's definitely not going to work. But it illustrates the principle that after transforming the image into a numerical representation, you've got a point. In this case, you've got a point in a 3D space. And that's nearest neighbor search. If you want to find similar images to the, to the image the user just, has just given us, we, um, we look up other images, other points which are close in that space. So that is nearest neighbor search. The way we would actually do it is something more complicated. So recently, the, the, the most uh, fashionable way of doing this and probably the most effective is uh, deep learning. So this is a very simplified diagram of a convolutional neural network. So basically, the, the black square, the far left end of, of, of the slide is, a, is, a, is the image that you start with. And then you basically build a machine learning model which successively detects more and more interesting features of a given image. So let's say at first you, you detect just simple edges. Uh, is, there, is there a line in that part of the image that goes from left to right? That sort of stuff. But then as you progressively build better and better representations, you start to learn more and more about an, about an image. So maybe in the first layer you just detect edges, in the second layer you detect shapes, is it a square, is it a circle? And in the following layers you you, you detect high and higher level concept. Is it a cat, or is it a dog, or is it a building, or is it a bridge? Now, the nice thing about it is that in the final layers, you've got a, a long list of numbers, an ordered list of numbers, a vector, which represents a point in space, in a high dimensional space. And the nice thing about it is, well, the images of cats in that space are going to be close to other images of cats, and the images of bridges will be close to other images of bridges. So that's how you can do very good, very good image search. Uh, and, and this is indeed what we do at List. We sort of process, take images and process them into this point representation, high dimensional space, and then we want to use nearest neighbor searches to find similar images. Uh, that's useful for two things. Like one thing is search, you give us an image and you, we can find you similar images. Or maybe you type in a text phrase and then we convert your text phrase into a point in the same high dimensional space where the images are and suddenly we can find images which are similar to the text you typed. So that's really cool, and that's something we can do. Other, other useful applications, the duplication. So we've got, uh, we've got two images, and we have no metadata associated with those images. But 
we know that these are the same products, like the underlying truth is this is the same product, and we can use this nearest neighbor search to find out that these are the same products and present them just as a single thing rather than two, two disparate things on a website. So that's really useful. And other applications recommendations. So um, the, this approach is known as the sort of collaborative filtering approach. So basically you, you have your products and you have your users and you represent both products and users as point in space. So let's say we take our products and this is, this is a handful of points and we cast them at random into this high dimensional space and we do the same for users. These are our users and we represent them as points and we cast these points at random into a high dimensional space. And then what we do is, well if a given user, i.e. a point in our space, interacted with a given product, we draw the points together. But if a given user did not interact with a given product, we push them further apart. And the nice thing about it is, at the end of this pushing apart and pulling together process, users end up close to the points, to the products that they will like, and far apart from the things that they wouldn't like. So when we want to recommend things to a user, well, we look up the point that, they, that, that represents them in the high dimensional space, and then we use nearest neighbor search to find, um, to find the products that they would like. So that's also very, very useful. So I'm a data scientist and you know, data scientists are very excited by these sorts of things and we spend a lot of time thinking about them and implementing them and, and you sort of go away and you work for six months and you, you, you come up with this amazing solution where you translate pictures of products into this high dimensional space where similar, um, similar products are close in space and you say, well, as a data scientist, I've done this amazing thing and it now works and it's going to be great. Let's just deploy it on the website and make lots and lots of money or make our users really, really happy. Now, this is where you are as a data scientist, you've got your beautiful child, which is going to be great, and you sort of go and let's just deploy it, let's make, let's make it work. Um, so how would you do it, right? You, you are given a query point, or you take a user, and you want to find all the nearest products, and that's simple, right? You go to your database, and you find all the points representing products, and you compute the distance between your query point and all the points, all the products in your database, and you just order that, and you give the closest ones. Simple, right? I mean, it couldn't be, couldn't be simpler. So, yes, but no. Uh, the problem is, at least, we have 80 million images, and we have about 9 million products. So, if we wanted to do the simple solution, i.e., you know, calculate distances with all the points, uh, and then return the closest, our users would be, would be very, very bored by the time we finished. It would take literally minutes. So, that will not work. Okay, so how do we make it work? Locality sensitive hashing to the rescue. So, we all know about hash tables or dictionaries in Python. So we're going to build a special hash table. So we're going to pick a hash function, which unlike normal hash functions, it maps points that are close together in space to the same hash code, which is very different than normal hash functions, which are supposed to map things uniformly over the hash space. Uh, so this is sort of special. It picks two points that are close together in your space, will map to the same hash code. And you just build a hash table, a normal hash table using that. So you take your points and you take the hash codes and then you put your points in the, in the hash buckets corresponding to your hash codes. And then magically, all your points that are close together will end up in the same bucket. And when you're doing search, you just look up the bucket that you need and you just search within that bucket, which is really nice. Um, so to do this, uh, at least, uh, we use random projection forest. And I'm going to tell you how that works. Um, so this is our imaginary space of points. So we've got about 100 gray points and uh, one blue point, which is the query point, the point that we want to find, uh, uh, find the nearest neighbors for. And this is how we do it. So, so if we didn't do locality-sensitive hashing, we would have to calculate the distance between the blue point and every other point, which takes too long. We, we cannot do that. So to make it faster, we draw a lan random line. That's the beauty of it. We just take take a random line and draw it. It has to go through the origin, but otherwise any line will do. And the nice thing about it is, well, if, you, if we look at the picture, most of the points that are closer to the query point end up on the same side of the line. And the points that are not close, not close to the query point end up on the other side of the line. So just by drawing a random line, we managed to create two hash buckets, and we only, suddenly we ha only have to look through half of our points to find nearest neighbors. So that's already you know, a speed up factor of two, just with one random line. And you know, we didn't have to do anything intelligent to draw that line, it's just a random line. So that's the nice thing about it. Uh, if this speed up is not enough for you, you draw another random line. Um, again, completely random, and the points 
that end up on the same side of the line end up in the same hash packet. If this again, the speed up is not enough for you, you keep drawing lines until you've got few enough points in your hash packet. And that's your, that's your speed up, right? So you, you draw enough lines to have small enough hash packets and then when you need to perform a nearest neighbors query, you take your blue point and you calculate which hash packet it should end up in and then just compute brute force distances between the, the query point and the points that are in the same hash packet. Uh, so that's the principle. Uh, if you, you can think of it as building a binary tree as well. So we start with all the points and then we have a split and the, the points that are on the left side of the line go into the left subtree, the points on the right side of the line go into the right subtree. And then we follow the right subtree in this example and do another split into a left subtree and right subtree and another split and another split. And you can, so sort of with a query point, you can start the root of the tree and then follow the splits until you end up in the right hash packet. So that's the principle of how it works. Now, it works really, really well in some cases, but in some cases it doesn't really work very well. So, the way we started this, uh, at least, we thought, well, we're going to draw a fixed number of these lines. And hopefully that will give us a speed up and hopefully we'll be accurate enough. So what we did is we decided on a dimensionality, let's say we want to do 100 random splits and then after 100 random splits we stop and then things that end up in the same bucket are the nearest neighbors and the rest we discard. Uh, that, that works reasonably well if your points are fairly uniformly distributed in your space, right? Because all regions of fairly equal density, wherever you draw the lines, your hash packets are going to end up to of roughly the same size, so the same number of points and the splits are going to be good enough. But in spaces where some regions, in problems where some regions of your space are of high density, but other regions are of low density, what you're going to end up is with buckets, some buckets having lots and lots of points, and some buckets being completely empty, neither of, neither of which is very good. So if you have a bucket with lots and lots of points, you're not going to get a good speed up. If you have a bucket with very few points in it, you're not going to get any results back, both of which are horrible. So. The first point is keep splitting until the nodes are small enough. So you don't take a fixed number of splits, you just build a binary tree and you split and you split and you split until you've reached your stopping criterion which is this bucket contains X number of points and when that happens you stop splitting and you take that tree. So that's the first point. The second point is use median splits. Uh, so if you just take random hyperplanes, random, random lines, um, you, can, you can end up with highly unbalanced trees. So the left subtree will be very short because for some reason there are very few points there, but the right subtree will be very, very, very deep because there are lots of points in that part of the space. That's not really horrible, but it's not great either because you spend more time traversing the deep part of the tree and you will be traversing the deeper part of the tree more often because that's where more points are. So median splits, you take a random line and then you calculate the median distance from the point to that line and then you split on that distance. So that you, it's guaranteed that half of the points will always go to the left tree and half of the points will always go to the right subtree. So that gives you nice balanced trees and faster traversal times. And the final point is build a forest of trees. So you don't just build one tree, but you build lots of trees. What's the reason for that? Well, the random projections algorithm and locality sensitive hashing in general these are approximate algorithms. They don't give you an exact answer. They're probabilistically correct, but in some cases they will be wrong. So if we look at this picture, if you look at the query point, well maybe there are some points to the left of the line that are closer to the query point, the points on the right side of the line. But if you build just one tree, we're never going to surface these points because then in a different part of the tree. So that's, that's a mistake that this algorithm makes. Um, and that's, that's not great. We want to have as good results as we can given the speed up. So the way we get around this problem is we build lots of trees. And because in each tree, the, the lines are chosen at random again, each tree will make its own errors, but they will not repeat each other's errors. So when you combine the predictions from all the trees, they will end up correcting for each other. And the, the accuracy score of the aggregate will be higher than the accuracy score of any single tree. So that's why, you buy, that's why you build lots of trees. Um, then another nice property of this approach is if you build more trees, you're going to get more accurate results at the expense of 
while having to traverse more trees, so it's going to take slower. But this is something you can control. You can pick a, basically, the trade-off between the number of trees you build, it, it draws you a performance curve, and you can pick a point on that performance curve, i.e. speed versus accuracy that's, um, that's appropriate for your application. So that's very nice. If you want pure speed, build few trees. You get pure accuracy, but you'll be very quick. If you want something accurate, but don't care about speed that much, build lots of trees, it'll be accurate, maybe not so fast. Okay, so that's the, that's the principle of the algorithm. Does anybody have any questions at this point? Because I'm, I'm happy to clarify. Obviously, it works well for two-dimensional points. How do you generalize it to higher dimensions? Like you, well, I assume you will use hyperplanes, right? But uh, how do you split uh, the feature space with a hyperplane? Right. So, so the algorithm, the, the, actually, the, one of the main reasons of the existence of the algorithm is high-dimensional spaces. Uh, and the reason why it's in 2D on the slides is because 2D is easy to visualize and high dimensional spaces aren't, so that's why it's in 2D. But basically what you do is, you, in the high dimensions, you draw a hyper, random hyperplane, which is, you know, whatever your dimensionality is, and then you, you do the same calculation. Uh, so it's, it's exactly the same principle, which is just in higher dimensions. And it works very well for, for very high dimensions. Um, I, I can, we can talk about that afterwards as well. Okay, so that's the principle of the algorithm. Um, how do you do it in Python? Since we're at a Python conference, it's, um, it's sort of useful to, to give an idea of Python packages. So there are, there are several Python packages for doing this. Um, one of them is Anoy, which is, um, which is a, a, a very cleverly named package, uh, ANN approximate nearest neighbors. Uh, very cleverly named package uh, from Spotify. It's very nice. Uh, it's a Python wrapper for C++ code. It's pip installable. Uh, it's very, very fast. It's actually very nice. Another, another package is LSH Forest, which is in scikit-learn. Those of you who are data scientists or play with ML, you probably already have scikit-learn on your computer, so it's really easy to use it because it's already there. Uh, and it's also quite, quite, quite easy to use. And then you've got Flan, which is, uh, I believe, um, C++ code, and it's sort of gnarly um, and hard to deploy. Um, the nice thing about it is you give it your data, and then it takes a long time to train, but it figures out the optimal structure for your problem, and that gives you high performance at the end. And there's a Python wrapper for it, uh, which works, I am told. Um, there are some, 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 some bits that we don't like as much. So LSH for us itself isn't scikit-learn. Uh, you can read the source, it's fairly readable, but it's actually very slow. Uh, so if, you're, if you want to develop for a high-performance application, maybe not the best solution. Uh, Flan is a pain to deploy. It's C++ code. You need to have CMake, all sorts of dependencies. Anoy is great. I recommend you use it. Um, but for us, it didn't really fulfill two important um, requirements. One is it doesn't allow you, once you build a forest of trees, you can't add any more points to it, which for us was a no-no. We need to add new products to the index as they come in. So this is something we needed. And secondly, um, you, cannot, you cannot do this out of core. You have to keep all the vectors in memory all the time. Um, so yeah, so like any engineer, we wrote our own. Uh, it's called RP Forest, which uh, speaks to the algorithm. It's available on GitHub and on, it's pip installable as well. Uh, so please go forth and try it out and break it in all sorts of novel ways and I'll try to fix them. Uh, it's quite fast. It's not as fast as Anoy, but it's, uh, it's fast enough for us. It's uh, certainly much, much faster than um, LSH Forest, which is built into Cycler. Uh, allows adding new items to the index and does not require us to store all the points in memory, which is, which is re really, really very nice. So how do we use it? We use it in conjunction with Post PostgreSQL. So basically we have a lightweight service uh, that has the ANN indexes in it, the RP forests. So we send a query point there and what it gives us back is these are the product IDs or these are the image IDs you are going to be interested in. So we get these IDs back and then we push them to Postgres and go, Dear Postgres, here are, the, here are the IDs, please apply the following business rules, so all the filtering, all, you know, all your worst statements, and so on and so forth, and then do final distance calculations also in Postgres using C extensions. So we store the actual point locations, the actual vectors, as arrays uh, in Postgres, and we've written some uh, C extensions to Postgres that allow us to do the distance calculations in Postgres, which is quite nice. 
Uh, side note, Postgres is awesome. Uh, if you're doing so, uh, all sorts of numerical stuff, you have arrays in Python, you, you have arrays in Postgres, uh, and you can write custom functions to do anything you want in C. So if you really want to, you can write your stochastic gradient descent machine learning algorithms in Postgres and run them in Postgres. Uh, I'm not sure you should do that, but it's definitely possible. So the whole combination, the, uh, the algorithm and the implementation and, and Postgres as a, as a data, as a backing store, uh, gives us a fast and reliable ANN service that we've deployed in production. Um, gives us approximately 100 times speed up uh, with a 60% precision at, at, at 10, means that if we get 10 nearest neighbors, we get the six out of 10 actual nearest neighbors using the approximate, uh, approximate approach uh, at 100 times speed up, so I think that's, um, that's reasonably good. Speed up over brute force, okay. over brute force. Not particularly demanding speed up uh, baseline, but, but that's where we start. Uh, so so we've, we've got that, it allows us, and the speed up that we gained, it allows us to serve real time results so we don't have to pre-compute, we can just serve it real time, uh, which is also very nice. Um, and it's all built on top of a real database. Um, so stuff like concurrency and updating the database, that's all taken care of uh, by, by smarter people than us. Um, so it works well. Anyway, thank you, and I'll um, be very happy to take any questions. Um, yeah, hi. Now, I've just did something like that for chemistry with distance, and I'm doing brute force. Uh, but I would like to ask you for an estimate of what number of uh, entries this is going to be hard. So when is my application going to need trees, like in the future? I don't know when. I mean, it's sort of an empirical question, right? So it then depends on your requirements as well. Mm. So let's say if you're doing offline processing and you want to, you, you don't really mind that it's taking 10 seconds or 20 seconds with the data you have, that's no. fine. But when you, let's say one lookup takes 10 seconds, but you need to do your lookup 100,000 times, then maybe that's, you know, that's, that's the point where you really want to look into these solutions. If it's fast, that, that, that's sort of, if it's, if it's fast enough for you, for what you're doing, you don't need it. Uh, so, it's it's so what was your pain point in, in your application? What was too long for you? Um, so let's say if we want to serve web requests, like 100 milliseconds is too long for us. Uh, and doing this brute force would take anywhere up to three seconds and it would completely destroy the database. So, um, so getting from three seconds to, 100, uh, to under 100 milliseconds, that was the, that was the difference for us. Hello, and thanks. I have a question about clustering. So are there any algorithms, like k-means and so on, which could be fast and precision, have nice precision? Thanks. Yes, so the, the question is, can you use clustering algorithms to achieve this, the same sort of effect? And yes, you can. And uh, there's an approach called hierarchical clustering, which again is uh, sort of building, building a let's say a binary tree, for example, where you, where you have all your data points and you, you put them into two clusters uh, and you, you build two clusters and then these are your two clusters on the first level of the tree and then you go down into each cluster and you recursively build more clusters and keep splitting the tree. That's also an approach, it's not something I have investigated, so I cannot, uh, cannot give you a good answer on what, what the performance trade-offs are. Any more questions? Cool. Thank, Thank you. Thank you much, yeah.